You know, whenever anyone talks about sleep apnea, it seems like everyone is fixated on this little acronym, AHI, the Apnea Hypopnea Index, which is just the number of apneas and hypopneas that you have per hour of sleep. But does it really tell the whole story? Allow me to drop a nuclear bomb on your perception of AHI. To start off, have you ever noticed that obstructive apneas, central apneas, and hypopneas are all treated as equal in the AHI calculation? What about the fact that an obstructive apnea that's 10 seconds is considered equal to an obstructive apnea that's 20 seconds? What about the fact that an obstructive apnea that has a 4% oxygen desaturation is considered the same as an obstructive apnea with a 10% desaturation? Also, the AHI threshold of five was created for research purposes back in the 70s, along with the categorizations of mild, moderate, and severe. And since then, they've never undergone any legitimate scientific scrutiny. It's culture, more or less. The apnea hypopnea index also says nothing about sleep architecture. We have important stages of sleep, and we need certain amounts of these stages. But none of that information can be gleaned by just simply looking at an AHI. And so, at this point in my career, it's my personal conviction that labeling a patient or saying to a patient that they have, say, mild sleep apnea can be a huge disservice because you can misleadingly shape their perception of how bad their health complication really is. Because we know also at the same time that not only are these categorizations not evidence-based, but that different patients present differently given the same objective readout. That is, if you have a patient with an AHI of 5, they may have a much harder time symptomatically than a patient with, say, AHI of 15. And so in other words, you have patients who will be told that they have mild sleep apnea, but really they're having a, a very, very difficult life. And you'll have another patient who has moderate sleep apnea, and they don't really care. They, they're not presenting symptomatically. The 10 second criterion, also random. Why 10 seconds? I mean, we're just, it's just clearly a human construct, right? I mean, we like nice, rounded, common, familiar numbers. 10? Why 10 seconds? What happens if it's 9? What happens if it's 15? What happens if it's 20? Is that 2? It's all arbitrary. What we see in more recent literature, too, is that a low arousal threshold also plays an important role in the presentation of symptoms for patients. So you can imagine, if you have a low arousal threshold, then you're not going to be creating these events because you're going to wake up and prevent the event, that is the obstructive apnea or the hypopnea, from becoming an obstructive apnea or hypopnea because you're being woken up before it's completed. So what do you make of that, right? So you could be having it on your way to an obstructive apnea seven seconds in, starting to desat, but you wake up because you have such a high sensitivity for the disturbance, or in other words, a low arousal threshold. On top of all this, the specifications for equipment used in signal acquisition has not been standardized, and so the way in which they quantify or score your sleep disorder breathing is gonna vary between facilities that you're scored at or between the people who are scoring. So you can have someone score your study and then a different person score the same study and the scores are gonna come out differently. We also know that there's night to night variability for patients. So if a patient gets a sleep study on one night, they could be placed in the mild category and then on a different night placed in the moderate category. Afterwards, they go to their doctor and their doctor says to them either they have mild or moderate sleep apnea. And you can see how that can start to be problematic because they'll carry that label with them into the future. And look, all is not lost. Researchers are already exploring alternative ways, such as looking at hypoxic burden, EEG signals, arousal intensity, and so on. The takeaway here is not to completely discard AHI. While AHI can get us started, it's just important to be mindful that it fails to capture the true complexities and nuances of sleep disorder breathing. And the way you perceive that is gonna affect the way you move forward. So I just want you to be aware and mindful of its limitations. And despite the negative sentiment that's enshrouding this video, I think the future of sleep medicine and sleep disorder breathing treatment is, and diagnostics is actually quite bright. Because at this rate, I mean, something like over a billion people in the world have 
an AHI over five. So the incentive structure is certainly in place for, for commercial juggernauts to find better treatments and better diagnostic standards. Good luck, guys.